Hello everyone. Today I am here with my second video and I am continuing my discussion on the topic chemical energetics. And before coming on to the topic, I would like to request you to use your headphones to listen to this video as the sound is not coming uh, properly, it is coming less. So let us start. Today I am going to discuss the importance or objectives of thermodynamics. So thermodynamics is a very important branch of science. It finds applications not only in chemistry or physics, it also finds its applications in engineering. In engineering, it helps us in determine, determination of efficiency of an heat engine. By efficiency, we mean that work done by the heat engine for the given amount of heat absorbed. The engine which gives us more work for the given amount of heat has more efficiency. Secondly, it also helps us to calculate the efficiency of a fuel that is the mileage number of kilometers per liter when we go to the filling station petrol pump then the boy over there asks us that which type of petrol do you want you want high speed or normal so we have two variant in petrol and they vary in their mileage and some other properties also thermodynamics also helps us in physics Many concepts of physics like light, heat, electric field, magnetic field are explained on the basis of thermodynamics. But here we are studying chemistry, so we will focus on the importance or the objectives of thermodynamics in chemistry only. So let us start. So the first objective which are, we are going to discuss is to predict the feasibility of a process. It helps us in the prediction of the feasibility of a chemical as well as a physical process. So before coming on to the topic, I want to discuss or I want to recapitulate two things. Number one, what is a spontaneous or feasible process? Number two, the correlation between the energy and the stability. The spontaneous process is of two types. Number one, the process which takes place of its own without the supply of any energy or with the help, without the help of any external agency. For example, the water flows down the hill. Water always flows downwards. It's spontaneous process, doesn't require any help. Second is the flow of heat from hotter body to a colder body. A spontaneous process, needs no help. What if we want to lift water upwards? Energy has to be supplied from outside. You have to use a water pump. And you have to continuously use a water pump as long as you want to lift the water in the upward direction. So this process involves absorption of energy, it is not spontaneous. And second type of spontaneous process is the process or the processes which require some initiation in the beginning. And afterwards, these processes goes on itself. A very simple example is burning of LPG at our homes. We just initiate the process by igniting with the help of a gas lighter or with the help of a matchbox and afterwards the reaction continues and gives us energy. And burning of LPG is a chemical reaction. LPG involves butane and isobutane and when butane burns in excess supply of air it gives us carbon dioxide, water vapors, and energy. 
So these were the two types of spontaneous processes. Second thing is the relation between energy and stability. We have studied in previous classes that a system at high energy state is unstable and a system at less energy is stable. And we can easily understand this concept by applying it on ourselves. After having breakfast or lunch, we all are at high energy state and we want to play, we want to do some work, we want to dance or we want to do some, something. We are quite active and here I am comparing for some time, I am comparing our activeness with unstability, that we are not stable because we are moving here and there. Once we have dissipated, once we have spent all amount of energy we have, then what we do? We sit aside, we sit aside and we are at rest physically as well as mentally. We don't even think, but we don't even want to think because thought process also needs some energy. So that state of minimum energy corresponds to maximum stability. So with the help of this concept, we can easily explain the spontaneity of various processes. Why water flows downwards? Why water flows down the hill? Because when water is at a high height, then it has more potential energy as I explained in my previous video. And when water is at low height, then water has less potential energy. Here, less potential energy, more stability. Here, high potential energy, less stability. So I think now you might have understood that water flows down the hill or downwards to minimize its energy and maximize its stability. And this is also the case with the hot body. A hot body is at a higher temperature, it is at a higher energy. And by radiating or by losing that extra amount of energy into the surrounding, it minimizes energy and it maximizes stability. Let us apply this concept to a chemical reaction. Let us consider a reaction that is A is changing into B. So what are the requirements for this reaction to occur? That the B should have minimum energy or should B should have less energy as compared to A. Because only then B will be more stable than A. Okay? Means that for the occurrence of this reaction, B should be more stable than A. And when B is more stable, B will be having less energy than A. So suppose that energy of B is 10 kJ and energy of A is 20 kJ. Understanding? Then this process is spontaneous because B is having more stability and less energy. Now we will explain uh, spontaneity in terms of energy released. Now here A is having energy 20 and when A is converted into B then the energy will become 10. But energy has to be conserved. It has to be same on both sides. That is here 20, uh, on the reactant side it is 20, then it must be 20 on the product side also because it has to conserve. So where, where that 10 kJ uh, energy will go? That energy will go to the surroundings. We will get that energy. That energy will be released. So that This means a 10 kJ energy will be released. This means that when B is having less energy than A, energy will be released or I can conclude that when a less stable system converts into a more stable system energy will always be released and the process will be spontaneous. So we can say that exothermic reactions are spontaneous. They are energetically favored. 
let us reverse the values for some time. The A is changing into B, but B is having more energy than A. Now this process is not going to be spontaneous because B is less stable than A. And if you still want to carry this process, then what you have to do? You have to supply extra 10 kilojoule energy from outside. That is, you have to give 10 kilojoule of energy, only then the A will be converted into B. This reaction involves absorption of energy. So this reaction is not spontaneous. So the exothermic reactions are spontaneous and the endothermic reactions are not spontaneous. So this was only the energy criteria. But at the later stages of this chapter, we will see that there are some reactions which are endothermic and still spontaneous. But those will be explained on the basis of another factor, another criteria that is entropic criteria, which we, which we will discuss later on. Now let us discuss the second objective of the thermodynamics, that is to predict the yield of the products or the extent to which the reaction would proceed before the attainment of equilibrium. What is the yield of the product? We know because we have studied what is yield. When we perform or we prepare an organic compound or inorganic compound in the lab, what do we do at last when the compound is prepared? We filter that compound properly, dry it, then finally weigh it. And the weight of that compound is called as yield. That yield means to say that how much products are formed. What is the quantity of products formed? But that weight is experimental yield. But thermodynamics helps us or it gives us mathematical relationships by which we can calculate the theoretical yield of a chemical reaction. Understanding? So this is also a very important application of the thermodynamics. Now we will discuss that how the yield or the quantity of product form helps us to study the extent of the reaction. Extent of the reaction ka kya matlab hai? Kitna reaction hua hai? Let us explain it with an example. This is A plus B. It is giving us C plus D and this is an equilibrium reaction. Okay. Equilibrium can come at the beginning of the reaction or it can also come at a later stages of the reaction. For example, if the equilibrium comes in the beginning, what does it mean? That only small amounts of reactant has reacted and small amount of product has been formed. Suppose in the beginning the, the concentration of the reactant is 100% and when only the 10% reactants have reacted that is 90% reactants are still unreacted. Only 10% have reacted. That only 10% products are formed and equilibrium came. This means that reactions has not gone forward to a greater extent. Because when the equilibrium comes, you know that reaction doesn't move. Want me to say react, uh, reaction appears to be uh, appears that it has stopped but rate of forward reaction and backward reaction becomes equal mean to say that there will be no change in the concentration of reactant on the products so in this case only small amount of products will be formed and the yield will be low so if we have low yield that reaction has not gone forward to a greater extent and if the yield is high Products are formed in a larger amount. This means that equilibrium has come at a later stage of reaction when almost uh, all the reactants have been reacted and the products are formed in a larger amount. In this way, 
ईल्ड कैन हेल्प अस द एक्सटेंट ऑफ ए रिएक्शन कितना रिएक्शन हुआ है अगर ईल्ड कम है प्रोडक्ट कम बने हैं तो इक्विलिब्रियम बहुत जल्दी आ गया है और रिएक्शन फॉरवर्ड ज्यादा नहीं गया है और अगर ईल्ड ज्यादा है प्रोडक्ट्स आर फॉर्म इन लार्जर अमाउंट देन द रिएक्शन हैज गॉन फॉरवर्ड टू अ ग्रेटर एक्सटेंट सो इन दिस वे थर्मोडायनेमिक्स हेल्प्स अस टू टू नो द एक्सटेंट ऑफ द रिएक्शन सो दिस वाज अ सेकंड ऑब्जेक्टिव्स ऑफ द थर्मोडायनेमिक्स द थर्ड एग्जांपल ऑफ द सॉरी थर्ड ऑब्जेक्टिव ऑफ द थर्मोडायनेमिक्स इज to reduce some important generalization of physical chemistry many laws of physical chemistry rolt law you can say this rolt law phase rule nernest distribution law and the uh, law of chemical equilibrium law of uh, chemical equilibrium these all law are derived thermodynamically that thermodynamic thermodynamics plays a very vital role in the derivation or of the expressions of these laws and laws of thermodynamics also helps us in drawing the conclusions of this law you know word generalization means conclusion that when you have four to five points and now you are uh, we want to conclude that that what is the conclusion what is the result and in drawing the conclusion or in generalizing the facts thermodynamics will be used it is very helpful so these were the objectives of thermodynamics in the chemistry so i hope that uh, i you would have liked the today's discussion and uh, i want to tell you that please don't hesitate in asking question if of any query you have any question you can leave your question in the comment box also or you can ask your questions through our whatsapp group or the telegram group and uh, i further request you to like share and subscribe my channel and uh, also press the bell icon for the further notifications and uh, thank you very much and thank you for watching my video